All right, welcome to session 14, our series on Luke Acts. Uh, today we're going to be diving into the book of Acts for once. So last week we finished off looking at Luke, we were looking at Yeshua's death and resurrection and the role that Yeshua played as the suffering and exalted servant, among other things. Um, so today we're going to kind of uh, jump in on the kind of looking at the overlap between the tail end of Acts, or the tail end of Luke and the beginning of Acts. So we'll start by looking at the uh, first two verses of Acts. So it starts out, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So we know a couple things just from these first two verses. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a part two, right? This is a sequel. This uh, We see the same sort of introduction that we see at the beginning of Luke. Luke is addressing this person called Theophilus, and he is talking about how he wrote a first book, um, and this is his second book. So this is the sequel. We're jumping in uh, to a part two here. And uh, so... It's interesting what he says. He characterizes the Gospel of Luke, which is part one, as all that Yeshua began to do and teach, right? Uh, so that implies that the Gospel of Luke was just like the beginning of Yeshua's works. This is what he began to do. So what is the book of Acts? It's what Yeshua continues to do. Uh, of course, uh, Yeshua ascends to heaven right away in this book, but he's still at work, right? The point is that Yeshua's mission and message is being carried on by his apostles. So in Luke, we find out what Yeshua began to do and teach. Now we're going to read about what he continued to do and teach through his apostles. So um, one of the things we never really delved into much in our opening sessions was who is who is Theophilus? Who is this guy? Um, and related to that is to whom was Luke writing? What, what was his imagined audience that he's writing to, right? His intended audience. Uh, so let's just touch on some of these questions a bit. Related to that, of course, is why did Luke write this? What was his purpose in writing Luke and Acts? Um, okay, so Theophilus was, well, we're not exactly sure who he was. Uh, there's been lots of different theories out there as to uh, who Theophilus was. Some people have proposed that he wasn't anyone. He wasn't even a real person. This was just a generic name for God lovers, Theophilos, right? A, a lover of God. So Luke is just saying, you know, all you God lovers out there here, this book is dedicated to you kind of thing. Uh, that's one theory that I've heard out there. I don't think that's true. And especially because when you look at uh, the beginning of Luke, if we just jump to Luke chapter one. Uh, look at how he addresses him. Uh, most excellent Theophilus, kratiste Theophile. It, it, that's not the sort of thing you would say if this is just a generic title for anyone who might happen to read this who loves God, right? Uh, he, this is a, a title of respect given to someone important, right? And so uh, the more uh, commonly accepted theory is that Theophilus is uh, an important person who's somehow facilitated Luke writing this. He's Luke's patron, maybe we could say, right? He was uh, sponsoring Luke to take on this project of writing these accounts. Um, 
the name Theophilus might suggest that he is a Greco-Roman of some sort, possibly a Gentile. Um, so some will suggest this was maybe even a Roman official who precipitated Luke's writing. What can we know about Theophilus? Not much. <laughs> he probably wasn't Jewish, although there have been some people who have argued that he was. I'm going to suggest he probably wasn't. We know he had been taught about Yeshua, right? It says, uh, you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So he had received some teaching about Yeshua. And Luke is writing these to give him greater certainty, right? Um, I'm going to suggest, and I don't have a ton to go off of on this, but uh, this I think would make sense. So take it or leave it. It's just my opinion uh, that Theophilus was a, some sort of Roman official who lived in Rome. The reason why I think maybe he lived in Rome is look at where the book of Acts ends. So Luke comes to the end of this two-part work, and it's in the city of Rome, right? And, and the ending, you have to admit, is, is a bit uh, disappointing. It's kind of open-ended. You feel like this isn't really a great conclusion, you know? You get to the last verse of Acts, and, and Paul is just there in Rome and teaching and stuff, and, and it's like, well, what happens next? What happened to Paul in the end? Did he get to go on trial with Caesar? What, like, what happened? Well, maybe Luke doesn't include that stuff because the person he's writing to is very familiar with those events. So he, Luke is, Luke's purpose is filling in all the gaps leading up to that. That's a possibility that I think is, is uh, plausible. Um, I also would... Uh, suggest that Theophilus was familiar with Paul's writings, uh, at least Paul's letters, to, Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, which would make sense if Theophilus lived in Rome, especially if he was a member of the community of believers in Rome, that he was familiar with the book of Romans, right? Uh, I think also, uh, and again, this is just my suggestion, but I think this is why in the book of Acts, when Luke introduces the figure of Paul, he doesn't call him Paul. He calls him Saul, right? Which is his Hebrew name. Uh, I think that Luke's readers would have recognized the name Paul. And Luke wants to keep his readers from finding out who this mysterious Saul character is until he springs it on them later in the story. And he's like, oh, by the way, this guy's name was also Paul. And suddenly people are like, oh, I get it now. And so it adds to some of the uh, the mystique in the reading process, right? Uh, that's, that's my suggestion. Um, so, of course, Luke is not writing just to Theophilus, right? But he's writing to the entire community of believers, I'm going to suggest, in Rome and beyond, right? I think Luke has a broader audience in mind as well. Uh, but it's... Um, yeah, Theophilus is the person that he names. Okay, so what's what's the purpose of Luke of of Luke Acts? What was Luke's purpose in writing? And again, there's scores of opinions out there. Uh, here are some of the most likely options as to why Luke would have set out to write Luke Acts to affirm followers of Yeshua in their faith, possibly new followers of Yeshua in their faith, people who maybe have received a bit of instruction but need more instruction in about Yeshua and about uh, about their faith. And this is kind of what Paul says, right? Or uh, sorry, this is kind of what Luke says uh, in Luke 1 4, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So so Luke's stated reason for writing is to affirm Theophilus, and by extension, other people who will read it in their faith in Yeshua, meaning he's writing to people who already have heard about Yeshua and uh, hopefully believed in, his, in him, right? And this will confirm and affirm them in that. So obviously, obviously that is a reason why Luke wrote, um, but that's probably not the only reason. Uh, I'm going to suggest at least that it's not the only reason. Other possibilities. Uh, here's another one. 
to address the question of God's faithfulness to Israel. Now, this becomes especially pertinent if we, uh, uh, if we believe that Luke is writing after the destruction of the temple, right? This is, Luke is addressing, I, I'm suggesting that part of what Luke is doing is addressing the theological conundrum created by the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE. Uh, this was like a real crisis of faith uh, for the early believers. You know, what's wh what happened to Israel? How can God be faithful? In some ways, it's similar to what Paul did in Romans 9 to 11, where he's talking about, has God rejected his people? You know, what's going on here? And Paul defends God's faithfulness to his people and says that eventually all Israel will be saved. So what Paul does in Romans, uh, theologically, or, or using, um, uh, you know, prose, right, Luke does with narrative. So Luke uses narrative to get across the same theological points that Paul does in Romans 9 to 11. I think we'll see that uh, fleshed out more as we go through, uh, through Acts. Uh, another possible reason why Luke wrote is to combat the accusation that Yeshua or his followers forsook, to forsook the Torah. I want to explain this last one just a bit. As we have seen, and as we will see even more in the book of Acts, Luke goes out of his way to demonstrate that the heroes in his story keep Torah. And we're going to see it come up over and over again in the book of Acts, this accusation that followers of Yeshua teach people to abandon Torah, or that Yeshua taught people to abandon Torah. And over and over again, Luke frames that accusation as false. This is, these are presented by false witnesses. Uh, these are false allegations. Um, and so it seems like Luke is going, you know, he's taking pains to demonstrate that these claims are not true, right? Well, why would he be doing that if no one believed that in the first place. I, I, I think he's responding to accusations that exist in, in Luke's day. Um, even more than that, I think Luke is presenting a pro-Torah stance as a rebuttal of, of what he sees as a misreading of Paul, right? Uh, the, the hero that Luke presents as Torah observant par excellence is Paul. Uh, you get up to the end of the book of Acts, Paul affirms that he has never done anything against Torah. And, and this is striking, right? Um, so if, if this is true, then, and there are several scholars who, who argue this, that, that Luke is trying to, going out of his way to present a pro-Torah Paul, um, then Luke represents one of the earliest commentaries on Paul right? If we want to call it that. <laughs> uh, and for us as believers, this is the authoritative commentary on Paul. Uh, that means we ought to read Paul the way Luke read Paul. Luke reads Paul as being Torah observant through and through, and we should read Paul the same way. So re remember that out of all the, the documents in the what we call the New Testament, the apostolic scriptures. Uh, Paul's epistles were the first to be written. All the gospels and uh, all the other epistles, the book of Revelation, these were all written uh, quite a while after Paul. Uh, so the first, the first documents of the New Testament that existed were Paul's letters, right? And all, so all these other letters, uh, oh, sorry, all these other writers had to contend with an existing Pauline corpus and and, and Pauline followers, as well as a growing misinterpretation of that corpus. And I think many of the New Testament writers deliberately sought to counter anti-Torah interpretations of Paul. I think we see this in the book of Matthew, um, Matthew 5.17, Matthew 16, uh, 16 to 18. We see this in 2 Peter. He talks about how Paul wrote things that are hard to understand and some people have twisted. 
uh, in the book of Revelation, we see these affirmations of Torah observance that I think uh, are in part countering people who have misunderstood Paul. And I think Luke is doing that um, even more bluntly in the book of Acts. So uh, I think Luke had multiple reasons for writing Luke Acts, but I, I think these are these are some of them. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about the overall narrative shape of the book of Acts. So uh, let's look at one verse here in Acts 1, verse 8. Yeshua says to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Luke places this statement at the beginning. It actually functions kind of like a table of contents for the entire book. This is like an outline of the book is, is right here, right? So um, we have, it starts out by saying, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right? To the Jews. And we see this in Acts 1 to 7. In Judea and Samaria, um, going out to the Samaritans, we see that starting in Acts 8 and in Acts 9, and then to the ends of the earth, which means to the Gentiles, Acts 10 to 28. So there is this three-stage progression of, of this, this movement of the Yeshua followers, right? Uh, it goes first to Jews, then to Samaritans, and then even out to Gentiles, these three stages of, three phases of expansion, right? Thinking of that a little bit, uh, I mentioned how, you know, uh, if you, well, in the first chapter of Acts and the second chapter, all these opening chapters, the focus is on Jerusalem, right? We're, we're centered in Jerusalem. By the time we get to the end of, end of Acts, however, we're in Rome. And so some interpreters, and I think this has been common throughout Christian history, have seen in this a, a progression, the, that there's a gradual diminishing of the importance of Jerusalem and that the the that status of being the capital of Christianity, quote unquote, moves from Jerusalem to Rome. Uh, that's a convenient way of looking at it for the Roman Catholic Church, right? Um, you know, no longer is Jerusalem the epicenter of Christianity. Now it's moved to Rome. So the so they would say the overall narrative shape of Acts is this movement away from Jerusalem towards Rome. I think that is not at all the sort of uh, shape that we see when we look closely at, at the book of Acts. Uh, although Acts begins in Jerusalem and ends in Rome, that does not mean that Jerusalem is set aside in favor of Rome. Actually, what we see is constant circling back to Jerusalem, every phase of expansion. So we go out to uh, Judea and Samaria, and it circles back to Jerusalem. We go out to the Gentiles, it circles back to Jerusalem. We go out to Paul's ministry, and it circles back to Jerusalem. And uh, and and even to fa Paul's final missionary voyage culminates in this big dramatic uh, journey back to Jerusalem. So far from Jerusalem being pushed to the margin, Jerusalem keeps coming up over and over again. Uh, I want to look at this quote from uh, Luke Timothy Johnson. It's, uh, I know there's a lot of text here, but I think it's worth uh, hashing this out here. He says, Luke describes first the community established by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost up to the scattering of the followers, except the apostles, uh, caused by the execution of Stephen in chapter 8, 1 to 3. So, so, so the, the first phase, he's saying, is focused in Jerusalem. But then when we get to after Stephen is executed, then they are scattered. Everyone but the apostles is scattered outward, right? 
Um, so there's this expansion that takes place. Then he shows the spread of the, of the good news through Samaria and Judea in chapters 8 and 9. And then with the conversion of Paul, Luke prepares us for the final geographic expansion to the ends of the earth, or earth reached symbolically when Paul arrives in Rome in chapter 28. The basic geographic movement of Acts then is outward, out from Jerusalem. But Luke introduces an important variation in this simple inward outward geographical pattern. He shows how each outward impulse is followed by a circle back to the city of Jerusalem. So the mission to Samaria in chapter 8 is confirmed by John and Peter from Jerusalem. Saul returns to the city of Jerusalem after his call only to be sent out again in chapter 9. The baptism of the household of Cornelius is defended before the leadership in Jerusalem. So after Peter's gone out to Cornelius, he comes back to Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas to confirm the mission to Gentiles in Antioch uh, in chapter 11. Paul's mission to the Gentiles is debated and then confirmed by the Apostolic Council in Jerusalem in chapter 15. And Paul journeys to Jerusalem and confirms with James in chapter 21 before he's arrested and ends finally in Rome. Even as, as he moves the good news to other nations and other peoples, Luke keeps reminding the reader of the city of Jerusalem and its place at the center of the story. So I, I know that was a long quote. I hope it wasn't too confusing or too hard to follow. But yeah, basically, if you analyze the geographical patterns in Jerusalem. Every outward movement is followed up with a movement back to Jerusalem. And this pattern repeats itself throughout Acts. So I think it's very clear that Jerusalem is still the center. Uh, and even more than that, I, I, I like what he says about how this the ends of the earth are reached symbolically when Paul finally arrives in Rome. Um, Here's a quote from Isaac Oliver. He's, uh, I won't read through the whole thing, but um, a couple things he emphasizes here. J this phrase, the ends of the earth. So that this is, you know, we've got Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. These are the three phases, ends of the earth being the last one. And Luke, Luke's purpose in the book of Acts is to show the gospel going out to these three phases, right? And the climax is when Paul gets to Rome. Um, I want to jump down to uh, here in, in this quote from Isaac Oliver. He says, uh, compare the Psalms of Solomon. This is, this is a, a pseudepigraphal work um, from the late Second Temple period, uh, which describes Rome... Rome comes from the ends of the earth, um, from Eschatu um, Teisches, to conquer Jerusalem, right? So, so in this second temple Jewish text, they describe Rome, this, this evil empire, coming against Jerusalem to attack Jerusalem from the ends of the earth, right? So Rome represents the ends of the earth. In Acts, it's reversed, the disciples go forth from Jerusalem and attack Rome, thereby reversing the axis of, axis of conquest, threatening through the dissemination of the gospel to take over the very last frontiers of the Roman Empire. Rome is not the center of the world for Luke. Rather, the word of God goes out from Zion to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem lies at the center to which Luke always points back. I think these things are important to uh, understand this overall shape that Luke gives us in the book of Acts. Okay, let's dive in. <laughs> this is all somewhat by way of introduction. Uh, let's, let's take a look now at Acts chapter 1. And let's read... Uh, let's read verses 4 to 11. Could I get a volunteer to do that, please? I can read for you. Sure, that'd be great. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, 
but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Yeshua, who is taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. All right. So here we read about um, Yeshua commissioning his disciples and then his ascension into heaven. Um, this is what we get at the tail end of the Gospel of Luke as well, right? The last few verses of Luke, uh, Yeshua gives his commission um, talks about, you are my witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father to you, but stay in the city till you're clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them as, and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising God. So, uh, by the way, note that the Gospel of Luke ends in the same place that it began, in the temple, right? Uh, Luke starts in the temple, it ends in the temple. Uh, and this, the city of Jerusalem and the temple remain a focal point in the book of Acts as well. So both passages emphasize this, the promise of the coming Holy Spirit, right? Um, Notice this, uh, this question that the disciples ask. Uh, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, it doesn't say restore the kingdom of Israel. Uh, I mean, maybe there's part of that implied, but restoring the kingdom to Israel, uh, restoring national sovereignty right i mean this is this is kingdom language but this is what the kingdom uh meant for them right it, you know based on everything we've read in luke so far we should be asking the same thing right we see throughout the gospel of luke all these promises of national restoration political uh restoration deliverance from rome all these sorts of things, right? Yeshua is coming as king to reign on the throne of his father, David, and his kingdom will be of no end. So when's that going to happen, right? Well, um, now would be a good time now that uh, Yeshua has risen from the dead, right? Isn't that, isn't that what's supposed to happen next? And so it's a natural question for the apostles to ask. Most scholars, however, assume that the disciples' question demonstrates that they just didn't get it. They had misunderstood the kingdom. Here, I'll give you an example. This is a quote from uh, I. Howard Marshall's commentary on Acts. Um, he says, Their question is whether Jesus intends to restore the kingdom to or for Israel. This may reflect the Jewish hope that God would establish his rule in such a way that the people of Israel would be freed from their enemies, especially the Romans, and established as a nation to which other peoples would be subservient. If so, the disciples would appear here as representatives of those of Luke's readers who had not yet realized that Jesus had transformed the Jewish hope of the kingdom of God by purging it of its nationalistic political elements. Um... Yeah, so my question for Marshall would be, 
where did Jesus do that? <laughs> where, where, where did Jesus transform the Jewish hope of the kingdom of God by purging it of its nationalistic political elements? Uh, I mean, this is, this is standard fare as far as conventional Christian theology goes, right? What we've been uh, presenting in this series is not at all what the way that Luke Acts has typically been interpreted. But uh, from my perspective, I can't see any other way than what we than the way we've been viewing it, right? I mean, Luke has been very blatant in in presenting the kingdom in nationalistic and political terms. According to these scholars, Yeshua's answer. Uh, how does Yeshua respond? He says, "It's not for you to know the times or season the Father is fixed by my, by His own authority." Um, these scholars would say that Yeshua's answer completely dismisses the disciples' question as inappropriate. You know, you you uh, dense disciples, you just haven't gotten it yet. Stop thinking about such carnal Jewish aspirations and realize it's all spiritual now. Um, so that's the way some some interpreters would approach this passage. Other scholars take a different approach and argue that Yeshua does not reject their question, but he redirects it. Uh, so instead of focusing on the timing, Yeshua says, they should focus on the power of the spirit as embodying the kingdom, right? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. So so stop talking about, you know, when is the timing going to happen? All that? No, no, it's all, it's about, you know, Holy Spirit's coming, that's going to give you power, and, and that's going to be the true restoration of Israel, right? The true restoration of Israel is going to take place in the church, the people, the new people of God constituted through the outpouring of the Spirit. And that's the way some interpreters will look at it. Um, so does Yeshua's answer dismiss the apostles' question? Or does it redirect the apostles' question? I'm going to suggest a third approach. Does it af affirm the apostles' question? I think that's the correct answer here. I don't think Yeshua's reply is a rebuke, a dismissal, or a redirection. I think Yeshua is affirming that, like, this is, this is important, you, you know, this is a legitimate question, but what, is he, what does he say? It's not for you to know times or seasons, right? In Greek, this is the word chronus e kerus. So um, times and seasons. Uh, a couple sessions back, we looked at how these two words appear in, uh, these are the same two Greek words we find in the Septuagint of Daniel 2.21. So remember this phrase, times of the Gentiles. Yeshua says that Jerusalem will be trampled until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And uh, Mark Kinzer has suggested that times of the Gentiles here is talking about the, uh, the reign of the four empires mentioned in Daniel 2 and 7. Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. These are the Gentile kingdoms that dominating Israel. Until that time is completed, Jerusalem will be trampled. But once it's completed, the implication is there will be the redemption. So here, Yeshua is referring back to that. He's not saying there's, there's not going to be any times or seasons, you know, get that notion out of your head. He's saying there is going to be... These these empires, they're on a leash, right? They're they're on a time clock. When that time's up, the restoration is going to happen. But the Father has fixed that by His own authority, um, and it's not something for us to know. The, the true, uh, you know, the times of the Gentiles is not over yet. The destruction of Rome is not yet at hand, but God still has that in store. Yeshua doesn't dismiss or redirect their hope for a literal national and political restoration of Israel. Rather, he once again alludes to the fact that there will be a period of time between the announcement of the kingdom and its fulfillment. How long that period will be is only known to the Father. And then the, rest, the, the reality of a future restoration for Israel is confirmed just a few verses later, right? He goes up into heaven he lifted up and uh, they're gazing on and these angels look at, look at them and say, 
you know, what are you doing? This, this Yeshua who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Here we have an explicit prediction of Yeshua's return, right? What does that mean? He'll come in the same way as you saw him go. Well, how did, how did Yeshua go? Let's look at it. Uh, it says, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. He left in a cloud, right? So how will he return? On the clouds, as it is written in Daniel 7, verse 13. Let's look at these verses here quick. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So this is very messianic um, imagery, and, and we see this sort of thing used frequently in Jewish literature to allude to the coming of Messiah. He's going to come on the clouds. Something about clouds is, you know, there's something about Messiah and clouds. And it's here in Daniel 7, 13, right? There's a connection. Luke 21, 27, they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Uh, Revelation 1, 7, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. So uh, how did Yeshua leave? He left in the clouds. How is he coming back? He's coming back in the clouds. That's how Messiah comes, right? This will be the, uh, you know, the grand entrance where it's not just a, a hidden arrival onto planet Earth uh, in uh, manger in Bethlehem, like happened the first time. This time it'll be dramatic and every eye will see it right? Um, returning as he left also relates to what we talked earlier about the return of God's presence to Zion, right? From where did Yeshua leave? From the Mount of Olives. How will he come back? He will come back to the Mount of Olives. In the book of Ezekiel, we saw how the divine presence left the temple out and went out to the Mount of Olives and uh, sort of hesitated there on the Mount of Olives. And then at the end of Ezekiel, the glory comes back and comes back to the temple and it comes from the Mount of Olives, right? Zechariah 14, four, uh, on that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. So Yeshua will one day return to the Mount of Olives so that he can reenact his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Only this time, the city and all the people, including its leaders, will truly receive him. So far from dismissing the notion of a literal, literal restoration of, for Israel, this passage in Acts chapter 1 only enhances it, right? And it's, it's affirming that this, this literal re national restoration for Israel, for Jerusalem, will take place because Yeshua will return in the same way that he left. All right, let's look uh, we're not going to read this next passage, but if you have your Bibles open, you can uh, sort of skim through. Uh, in the rest of chapter 1 of Luke, we see uh, this, uh, they, they choose another apostle, right? Let's just take a quick look at how it starts. They, they return to Jerusalem. This is in Acts 1 verse 12. They return to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. Uh, or olives, <laughs> which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath stay journey away. Uh, by the way, why does it throw in this phrase, a Sabbath day journey? Um, why would Luke say this? Have you ever wondered that? Why would he throw that in? Uh, you know, at first glance, you might think, oh, well, maybe he, maybe that's because that was a Sabbath the day when they went back to, you know, when Yeshua ascended. But, well, according to what Luke says in up in verse 3, Yeshua appeared over a period of 40 days. And so, and as we mentioned last week, I think Luke is very clear that Yeshua rose from the dead on a Sunday. So if you count 40 days from, from Sunday, you, you don't get to a Shabbat. You don't get to Sabbath, right? So, uh, I don't think that this event takes place on a Sabbath. Why then would he say this? Because he's um, 
really, again, reiterating that they're Torah following? I think so. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, like, look at how casually he throws that in there, right? And he doesn't, he doesn't try to explain it. It's like, you know, well, what's a Sabbath day journey? Uh, apparently, Luke uh, knows what a Sabbath day's journey is. Uh, and apparently he assumed his readers would know what a Sabbath day, Sabbath day's journey is. Uh, had Luke and his readers assumed that the Sabbath was abolished, this phrase would be meaningless, right? Why, why would that be there? So um, Isaac Oliver suggests that this casual reference to a Sabbath day's journey suggests that both Luke and his readers not only understood the concept, but probably observed the Sabbath travel limits themselves. Um, yeah, so apparently Luke assumes his readers are more familiar with uh, the details of Sabbath praxis than they are with the topography of Jerusalem and its surroundings, which is interesting. All right. Um, so, yeah, then they, they go back to Jerusalem and... And then it lists the, they go to the upper room and it lists the people who are there, right? Peter and John, all the, all the apostles. But of course you count them and there's only 11, right? So um, then Peter is like, we need to choose a new guy to replace Judas because he, he left. <laughs> yeah, Judas went to the place uh, apportioned for him. So here's a question. Why do they need to replace Judas? Why, why, why pick another apostle? What's wrong with just sticking with 11? Let's take a look at a couple passages here. Luke 22, 30. Let's start there. So Yeshua says to his disciples, um, here, let's provide some context. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, Yeshua is telling his apostles, these 12 apostles, they're going to be part of his government in the kingdom. And judging the 12 tribes of Israel means that these 12 tribes have been reconstituted as 12 tribes, right? Uh, look at some of these other passages. Paul, towards the end of Acts, he says, I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And that's a, a what were they hoping for? What were the 12 tribes hoping for? as they worship night and day, the restoration of Israel, right? <laughs> I mean, for there to be all 12 tribes back together again, this implies that Israel has been restored. And again, if we go to uh, the book of Revelation, talking about the new Jerusalem, it had great high walls with 12 gates. Uh, and of course, the gates are the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Uh, that's those names are inscribed has 12 foundations and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. So there's something about the number 12. That's important. It relates to the 12 tribes of Israel. We need 12 apostles because they need to be the judges of the 12 tribes of Israel. I want to suggest that for as far as the apostles in acts one are concerned, this is not just pretty symbolism. If we connect the action of the apostles here with their question back in verse 6 and the statement of the angels in verse 11, they had to pick someone to replace Judas because they expected God to restore Israel, right? Literally, like literally restore the 12 tribes of Israel. They expected Yeshua to come and defeat Rome to gather the exiles of Israel and to set up his government over the reconstituted kingdom of Israel, complete with all 12 tribes. And my guess is that they expected this to happen in their lifetime. 
of course, we know that this did not happen during their lifetime. Even at the time that Luke is writing, that some of the apostles have already died, right? He records the death of James in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. And by the way, it's interesting that in Acts 12, after James dies, they make no attempts, attempt to replace him, right? They're not like, oh no, now we're back down to 11. We need to pick another apostle. They, they don't do that. And actually, as, as we'll see when we get to chapter 12, uh, after that moment, the 12 apostles begin to fade from view. By the end of Acts, the community of believers is not led by the 12, but by James and the elders. Uh, and so there seems to be a, a shift that takes place throughout the book of Acts. We'll see that as we go. I think the reason why they replace Judas and not James is because Judas not only died, but he forsook his position as apostle. James retains his position. This, this is James, the, the disciple, retains his position and will fulfill it at the resurrection. It's a little confusing because there's two different Jameses in, in Acts. There's James, the brother of Yeshua, who becomes the leader of the Jerusalem assembly from chapter 12 onward. And then there's James, the brother of John, the, the apostle, who was the first of the 12 apostles to be put to death. So by the, by the time we get to the end of Acts, we have a sense that this hope for this uh, restoration of the 12 tribes of Israel, that this hope will be postponed, right? You know, the death of the apostles uh, kind of makes that clear. But the, that hope is not abandoned. I think Luke still believes that at Yeshua's return, the apostles will be raised from the dead to, to fulfill their role as judges over the 12 tribes. At the same time, however, the community of believers in Acts represents a first fruits of the restoration of Israel. Well, just a foretaste, the believers in Jerusalem stand as a microcosm of the full restoration that Yeshua will accomplish at his return. All right, let's, uh, we need to tackle at least a bit of the material in chapter two before we're done. Uh, so chapter two, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, describes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and disciples uh, on the day of Shavuot or Pentecost, right? Pentecost is the Greek word um, uh, meaning 50, right? And because uh, of the 50 days between Passover and the feast, uh, in Hebrew it's Shavuot weeks because you count seven weeks, right? So we've we've already looked at these, this chapter in some detail in our series on the Holy Spirit. We talked about how the events in Acts 2 mirror what took place at the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. Uh, and we looked at the threefold, the threefold outpouring of the Spirit that takes place over the course of Acts and how that relates to the Great Commission. I don't want to repeat all that here. If you want, you can find those sessions on the Segula website. Uh, today, I want to touch on some different things. Uh, hopefully, um, it'll be uh, relevant as well to what we're talking about. So, first, we should talk a little bit about the significance of Shavuot in the book of Acts. Uh, if you remember, back in chapter 2, Luke talks about, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 2. So, if we go all the way back to Luke chapter 2, Yeshua talks about how, Luke talks about how Yeshua and his family go up to Jerusalem for a certain feast. What feast was that? It was, this is Luke 2, 41. They went up for the feast of Passover, right? In the last half, the last half of the book of Luke then records Yeshua's long final journey to Jerusalem. And again, it's for the feast of Passover. So there's Passover plays a special role for the gospel of Luke. Here in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, we see the disciples gathered in Jerusalem for the feast of 
Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, right? Uh, in Acts 19, chapters 19 to 21, we read about Paul's long final journey to Jerusalem, which, it, you know, it parallels Yeshua's journey to Jerusalem in the Gospel of Luke. So, so Luke, so Paul has this long final journey to Jerusalem. By the way, what feast is he going to Jerusalem to celebrate? Turn to Acts 20, verse 16. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Shavuot. Right? So, in other words, in Luke, we have, in chapter 2, an initial journey to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, and then Passover becomes the dominant uh, theme uh, for like the final chapters as, as Yeshua is journeying there to Jerusalem for Passover, which brings the whole uh, gospel to its dramatic conclusion, right? To its climax. In the book of Acts, we have in chapter two, the disciples celebrating Shavuot in Jerusalem. And then this climactic journey to Jerusalem that Paul makes is also for Shavuot. So the role that Passover plays in, in, in Luke, Shavuot plays in Acts. Luke is themed around Passover. Acts is themed around Shavuot. What do these two feasts have in common? They're both pilgrimage festivals, right? Three times a year, you're supposed to go up to Jerusalem if you're in the land of Israel and um, you're not uh, unclean or on a journey. Um, you're supposed to go up these three times and they are Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, right? So we have Luke is about Passover, Acts is about Shavuot. But what about Sukkot? What about the third pilgrimage festival? I think this sets us up to expect a part three to Luke Acts that describes Yeshua's return and is themed around Sukkot. So this is this is the missing the missing uh, conclusion to the trilogy. <laughs> Luke Acts is supposed to be a trilogy. <laughs> so far, we haven't gotten to part three yet, but there's this we're we're set up to expect that that's coming, right? There's going to be uh, a grand finale, and, and it's going to be themed around the festival of Sukkot when God is dwelling with his people once again. And all the nations are gathered in to celebrate as well. All right. Anyway, I, I, I think all this suggests that, number one, Luke had a high regard for the biblical calendar. Number two, Luke assumes his audience is familiar with that calendar. And... Number three, Luke depicts the early believers as continuing to follow that calendar. Okay, so Acts chapter two. Here we read about the birth of the church. Uh, has anyone ever heard that? That uh, Acts chapter two is, is the birth of the church? <laughs> I don't think that's quite what Luke is presenting here. And I think everything we've read up to now should... Uh, give us that um, should uh, help us avoid making that conclusion. All right, so the Holy Spirit comes on them on Shavuot, on the, on the apostles, and there's this commotion, and every, every, uh, all these Jews dwelling in Jerusalem uh, from every nation come together, and they're like, what's going on, right? Here, let's jump to the passage. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. Uh, by the way, this is why I don't think that, contrary to church tradition, I don't think the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place in the upper room. Uh, I think it makes more sense that, at least by the time we get to verse 5, they're in the temple. Right? Where else in Jerusalem are you going to have enough room for large multitudes to come together and 3,000 people to hear a sermon and get saved, right? Like, uh, I, think, I think this takes place in the temple. 
Um, anyway, we won't go into that anymore right now, but uh, they're, they each hear them speak in his own language and they're amazed and astonished saying, are not those who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And then it goes on and lists the different types of uh, people. This is a rundown on the Jewish diaspora as Luke sees it. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. Got to be specific here, right? And visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Um, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And some of us are amazed and perplexed at this list and asking ourselves, what does this mean? Um, <laughs> so why does Luke mention these random people groups? A lot of scholars have looked at this list of, of place names. By the way, th this is talking about Jews from all these places, right? Um, these are not Gentiles from these places. These are Jews from all these places uh, and throws in proselytes as well. Um, converts. Why why this random list? And it seems really disorganized, like like haphazard. I mean, there, there's a lot of scholars say there's this is such a random list. There's no structure to it. Um, it, it. You know, it's not like he's going from starting at the west and working his way east or anything. Like that. It's just random here, there, and all over the place. Uh, Richard Bauckham has suggested that there actually is a very uh, significant structure to this list. And uh, I'm going to pull up this map. I know this is not super great quality, but this is from his, his book, uh, his essay, James and the Jerusalem Church. So um, what he notes is that if you follow, uh, like kind of a connect the dots sort of thing, to uh, all these places, we, you start uh, with places that are east of Jerusalem, places north of Jerusalem, places west of Jerusalem, and places south of Jerusalem. And every, every subsection goes out and then comes back to Jerusalem. Out and then back, out and then back out and then back. So, so it's, again, it's emphasizing Jerusalem at the center. Uh, so this reinforces what we saw before, right? Even as he's describing the, dias the Jewish diaspora, he's bringing it always back towards Jerusalem. All right. Um, I want to talk just briefly about Peter's sermon before we close. In chapter 2, starting in verse 14, Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted his voice and addressed them. Uh, and, and then he gives this long sermon. You know, these men are not drunk, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And then he gives this quote. And um, we should pay attention to the speeches in Acts. Luke conveys his theology through the speeches. On one level, Peter is speaking to the crowd around him. On another level, he's speaking directly to us as the reader, right? Luke is, is very skillful in the way he, he, he writes this. Um, so th there's, there's two levels that we can look at it. Yeah, he's addressing the Jews from all these different places, but He's also addressing us, and, and Luke is, is making a theological point here in what he's saying. Uh, in our spirit, uh, series on the Holy Spirit, we talked about how the Spirit is one of the promises of the restoration of Israel and the Messianic era throughout the Tanakh, right? Over and over again in the Tanakh, we see these promises that God will restore Israel and pour out his Spirit on, on the people of Israel, Right, so so the the outpouring of the spirit is an expectation that's associated with the kingdom and with the restoration of Israel. One of those passages from the Tanakh is Joel chapter two, 
which Peter immediately quotes. In the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit. They shall prophesy and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood, fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In other words, Peter is looking at this event that just happened, the, the spirit being poured out on the apostles, and he immediately connects it to prophecies of the restoration of Israel the eschatological end-time restoration of Israel. So, scholars such as N.T. Wright are going to say that the apostles expected Yeshua to bring the restoration of Israel, and then they see this event as constituting that restoration. In other words, the prophecies of Israel's re restoration in the Tanakh are fulfilled in the church. That's what people like N.T. Wright are going to say. So a corollary of that is to conclude that there will be no future restoration of Israel. This is it. It's already happened. The restoration's already taken place. It happened in the church in the book of Acts. That's the restoration of Israel. That's what all these prophecies were pointing forward to. Right? We can spiritualize them and say it's all about the church. Right? I don't think that's correct, <laughs> obviously, from what we've been looking at so far. First of all, is Acts 2 really the ultimate fulfillment of Joel 2? Were there, first of all, was the Spirit poured out on all flesh? No, it was not. It was poured out on, you know, uh, however many disciples it was. What does it say in chapter 1? A hundred and, hundred and some? 120, about 120 in Acts 1, 15. So it was poured out on, you know, roughly around 120 people. Uh, possibly uh, among the 3,000 who were saved, possibly they received the Spirit as well. It doesn't go into details about how exactly that worked. But the point is, it hasn't happened on all flesh. Um, it was not accompanied by wonders in the heavens, blood and signs on the earth, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. It wasn't accompanied by the sun being turned to darkness and the moon to blood. In other words, I want to say that what Peter is trying to get across here is that this is a foretaste. This is a, a first fruits of the final restoration. This is not the final restoration in total, right? But this is pointing to that. This is a a a, a down payment. I mean, uh, Luke, sorry, Paul, a couple places he uses this this phrase, uh, this term aravon, a down payment, a, a guarantee. The Spirit was given to us as a guarantee of the glory yet to come. Right. So this is uh, this is a foretaste of the final restoration, but it is not the fullness of that final restoration yet. Uh, I think that interpretation fits with everything we've said already, and it fits with what we will see as we go through Acts, given that I think it's very clear through the rest of Acts, there's still a future expectation that the apostles are looking forward to. We'll see more of that next week, but we'll have to wrap it up there. 